Okay, I think we can start. <clears throat> Thank you very much for being here. Welcome, uh, welcome everyone. This is the last event, uh, part of the project major event. Today we're going to be talking about um, European law. And um, I quickly want to talk about uh, this project before I leave the floor to, to, to Miriam for her presentation. Uh, O20 has been organizing this set of events in order to make sure that uh, the students make, make an informed decision when it comes to choosing their specialization and uh, understand whatever comes after their, uh, their bachelor and their academic class. So I really hope you enjoyed today's event and uh, I will leave the floor to Miriam. Thank you so much. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Miriam. Uh, I'm in my third year and I did the law major, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that today. Um, I think, yeah, okay. This is um, basically my introduction. You can read that on the screen. Uh, I think I'm gonna talk to you a little bit first about my specialization profile. So what is uh, basically needed or expected from a law student? If you could uh, look at the next slide. Oh no, motivation, my bad. So, yeah. <laughs> so the um, I chose the law major mostly because the economic and legal integration was my favorite one of all the first year courses. So I feel like I I already had done so much history and culture before, and uh, law was new and fresh and um, interesting. So I chose to do that. Um, yeah, then I'm gonna now talk a little bit about my specialization profile, exactly. Okay, so um, first of all, I think the law major out of all the majors in European studies is um, the most different one, especially because it is a little bit of a hybrid course because it's still, you're gonna have law teachers teaching you uh, law material, but it is still a humanities major, obviously, so in that way it's going to be a bit confusing at the beginning if you do choose it but bear with me you will definitely um, figure everything out um one of the main skills that i say would be needed of you uh is to be i think organized i think you would definitely uh again learn that with time and but at the beginning it would be pretty confusing i think too it was at least for me and uh, everyone who did it in my year. So things like reading a judgment or doing like a case summary are things that are, I think, um, yeah, a little bit strange to do at the beginning and a bit overwhelming, but with time, you'll definitely gotta like get a hang of it. Um, I think I'm gonna talk a little bit now about the courses I took. Yeah, during my specialization, exactly. So in my second year, I did the mandatory classes. So, um, it's a, Institutional and Substantive Law of the EU, which were <laughs> in these books. Um, then the second course I did was the Legal Skills Lab, which is a little bit different. It's more of a like independent project where you write an advocate's general opinion on a fictitious case. It was really interesting and it's kind of like the first time where you a little bit left on your own. Um, and then I could choose out of the electives and I chose the EU international relations law. So um, basically the place of the EU in international relations law, obviously. And um, so how the EU concludes treaties and um, like arrangements with other, with third countries. Uh, I really liked it. And then um, the other course I did was fundamental rights which I think was my favorite out of uh, all my second year law classes, um, which focused on the role of EU law in the protection of fundamental rights. So every week we had a different topic, a different section of um, rights that we would focus on. And um, then we, I think the, yeah, the, the assessment was uh, an essay on a case we could choose out of three cases. And I really liked that course. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit now, I think, about, yeah, so there are um, a lot of electives you can choose from in the second semester. I took the last two ones, so of that list, as you can see, International Relations and Fundamental Rights. There's um, 
Uh, other choices, there's migration law, private international law, I think this is a new one from this year, federalism, unequal Europe, uh, EU internal market law. So yeah, I think you can definitely, there's definitely a choice for you to, to get around. Um, yeah, so impact on second and, thir and third year. So obviously, um, you have all your mandatory classes next to the law classes. So I talked about my law classes in the previous slides. Next to it, I had Spanish 2A and 2B because I'm a, I am was in the language group one. Then I had the philosophy of humanities, which were two blocks in the second semester of the second year. And then the European studies workshop, which uh, again, doesn't have anything to do with law. It's just a workshop that every European studies student has to take. Um, and then I think we can, yeah, third year. Um, so I had to choose a second major. I chose culture, um, which were the two first blocks. Next to that, I chose a minor from the law faculty, um, which is called the law and justice minor. And then uh, different electives across throughout the year. I'm still doing one now, but these were not related to law. And then um, the research seminar for the thesis and the thesis itself. So these, um, the thesis you're going to do has to focus on a topic that relates to your major. So I did um, the research seminar for human rights and, uh, and now I'm doing it. So again, my thesis on a, on a law topic. Uh, I think I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so thesis topics. There are two uh, research seminars for the law majors. So there's one called human rights, which I was in, and then there's another one called the role of um, the court of justice in European law, which is also really interesting. Um, my topic is the European arrest warrant functioning and systemic issues. So I don't know if that reminds you of anything. I don't know if you've had the course yet, but um, this is what I chose. I asked around a little bit in my research seminar. So uh, some of my friends are doing it on gender-based violence and the role of the European Court of Justice, you know, the European Court of Human Rights on influencing it as a social norm. We also uh, had someone else doing it on the pot potential link between EU conditionality and the deterioration of the well-being of migrants in Bosnia. And then um, the last one on this list is not one of the is not is from like an interdisciplinary research seminar from someone who also did a law major. So on EU's responsibility to protect and uh, the inconsistent application of this norm um, with a case study on Myanmar. Uh, I think that seminar was called like fragile democracy. Sorry, democracy something. So they don't have to all be pure um, law. They can also be combined with something else. But I think if you're a first year, I don't think you would have to worry about that until, um, until you know, February, March of your third year. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the assessment and the grading. Usually it's closed book or open book exams, which is what I had like in uh, my second year. So closed book, obviously you can bring any notes. Open book, you can have with you um, the cases which you studied on uh, in the, throughout the course. Um, what I had, however, was that um, because a lockdown and online studying happened in my second year, I had a lot of essays to hand in at first. I think that was the easiest way my teacher found to uh, still assess us. So a lot of essays um, and also obviously like presentation on cases or case studies um, to to yeah, like grade participation or um, other, yeah, like group projects. Uh, yeah, I think that's it for the grading. Um, skills, so yeah, I talked a little bit about that in the beginning. Uh, I think definitely um, like the, the, sorry, the law classes are a little bit different than the, rest of the other classes how i said because you're going to have a lot of for example like readings um articles written by lawyers or legal experts there's a lot of jargon there's a lot of judgments that are going to seem really long and really complicated i think a lot of um what you're learning 
is just to learn how to do that. So learn how to um, read a judgment, how to write key summaries. Same, it's going to seem very complicated at the beginning, but at the end, you just like get very used to it. Uh, I think if I would give some advice, I would um, tell you to create like your own little list of cases or vocab or institutions that can be quite nice, especially because it's going to be like a lot of abbreviations and um, things to like confuse with other things. And it's just nice to like have it clear, nice, and you can just look at it. Um, like you're going to, you're probably going to, will use it in all your classes. It's nice to be like, oh, this case is familiar. Maybe we talked about it um, before. So it's nice to have a reminder. Uh, and then, yeah, I can just, sorry, I think there was a last point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sharing information with others is definitely um, a point I cannot stress enough. Uh, it is really nice to, again, like study for an exam and there you have like a presentation ready that someone did and where there's already like a case summary that they spent three hours on and it is really nice to just have it at your disposition at your disposal sorry um i think i don't know if people have questions but you can just send them in the chat and i think we'll talk about them later yeah uh just got a text to remind me of this um Unexpected encounters uh, that I had, I would definitely say, again, that it is a little bit of a hybrid course. So um, a lot of the confusion was just finding that out and adapting to it. But once that's done, it is pretty e easygoing, I'd say. Uh, I'm a naturally very confused person and I passed all my law courses. So I think that could be, I think, yeah, you can definitely um, get on with that. and. Um, be successful in the law major. Um, what was also a bit unexpected is that obviously once you graduate from European studies with a law major, you're going to be that, you're going to be a European studies student with a law major and you won't, it won't be the same status as someone who has a law degree. So if you um, want to choose a law master, you have to have the right amount of credits. I think it is 45 credits um, required if you want to do a law master. So you might want to do like electives or minor, which is what I did in the third year. It is pretty easy to get those points, but um, I think it's nice to be aware of that because you can easily, uh, there's going to be a lot to think about in the, in the third year. And it's nice to be aware that if you already want to think to later to after your bachelor's, maybe you should like plan this in. Um, yeah. So there definitely are gateways to to law masters um what i'm my future outlook on uh, life i guess is to i'm going to take a fourth year i'm going to do uh i think a conflict study minors a conflict studies minor which doesn't have anything to do with law but i think i can combine it with uh, my law background to maybe um then like look into masters that would be interesting um i think i saw something with uh like a law a law master that i thought was really interesting about conflict studies and human rights which would kind of combine a lot of the things i did through my bachelor um so yeah i'm not really set on that yet i'm still uh i'm still thinking but yeah i think um i think that's it for the for my future outlook um I don't know if that's the already. Yeah, we're already at the end of the presentation. So um, I think the questions are completely at the end or are they now? I don't know. So actually, <laughs> yeah, I think it would be nice to to have them now. Then everything's yeah. still fresh. Yeah, we already one. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, uh, Stefania is asking, what do you feel like are the job opportunities after doing uh, European studies with a major in law? Um, okay, so that is an interesting question. Obviously, if you are a European law graduate, um, you cannot be a lawyer per se because you don't have a law degree. So if you do feel like you really like law, you want to be a lawyer, you probably would have to do like a bridge year to fall back into um, the national system because you can't just be a European lawyer. 
um, lawyers are always attached to uh, a member state. Um, so I think there's definitely still a lot of opportunities like people are working in NGOs or becoming legal advisors, but you don't have um, what they call like a legal effect. So, um, but yeah, otherwise journalism, other fields like that, we can also combine it with other fields, which is also what is interesting um, with doing like uh, European studies and law, because you have a lot in your, and like in your, I guess, in bag to choose from. Yeah. I hope that answered the question. Um, okay, we have another one. Uh, have you ever thought about uh, other majors as well? And if so, what made you choose European law eventually? Um, yeah, so I was thinking at first about maybe doing history, but as I said, like I felt like I had done a lot of history in high school, especially, and then in the first year, I felt like I had a lot of just repetition. I wanted to change um, a little bit, and I like I really liked the European law aspect that it was still um, it still was very multicultural in a way that it touched upon uh, obviously European law. Um, so yeah, this is why I chose it eventually. I never really looked into uh, economics. I knew from the beginning I didn't want to do it. <laughs> and um, yeah, and then in the end, as my second major, I chose um, culture because also because it was different than European law. I guess European law is very, can be pretty dry sometimes and culture was kind of the opposite of that. So I went for that. Did you actually yeah. ever uh, doubt um, like during a course of European law being like, oh no, I think I should have taken something else or were you always like, okay, it's dry, but I still, that's still what I want to do. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I really liked it from the beginning. Like I was surprised to actually really fully enjoy it. Um, obviously it is dry and there's going to be a lot to study, but you're with a lot of people and it still is like very interesting. I think my favorite thing about it was just like all the cases and having like, you have really, if you have uh, the teachers that I had, they're still really, really, uh, they make it all really interesting. I like to like heard about, hear about like all the stories that happen in the cases and how that is then translated into law. Um, yeah, there were some classes where I was like, like I did um, in my minor, I don't want to like point fingers at anyone or anything, but I had a course that was um, called private law in Europe and um, like inequalities in private law and it was a lot of it was taught by obviously by a private law lawyer and that's when I found out that private law is not my favorite thing but um otherwise I never really doubted my decision no okay um we have some questions on internships uh did you do an internship or an exchange uh or would you recommend any of them I mean I definitely would recommend internship or an exchange. I personally haven't done either. I was planning on doing an exchange and then um, COVID happened. So instead I'm, I stayed here and I'm doing a fourth year here. Um, I definitely do know people who did either an internship or an exchange or both and they really recommended it. And I think it always is a nice option and a nice um, possibility for you to, you know, see something else, gain some experience but still to have it like within the frame of your bachelor that is also really nice to not it you know not be completely lost uh and have some yeah have some people that can advise you and yeah i guess the exchange still is really you do have a lot of help on how to organize it from the university and i think the internship even if you're kind of left to yourself it still is six months within a year and then you go back to classes so yeah yeah, there's actually a question also re just relating to what you said, whether we get uh, explanation explanations regarding the internship by the UFA. And I think we'll all agree that you, you get it, but you really have to ask for it specifically, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I know that if you want to find an inter internship, you're basically on your own. I know that you can hear a little bit, maybe here and there from teachers, but if you want to do an internship, you really have to... Um, like look for it yourself and um yeah as laura said i think otherwise you like you yeah there's not really that many events on how to do it because it is a bit of a an independent project like 
you always one it's always one person doing one internship at a time usually yeah all right i think they're not uh any questions anymore um i actually had a question because you said you did the minor in the law department mm -hmm. that minor is also 30 credits right or no was that was the, that minor was 15 credits okay um it was only half a year so yeah that is only uh 15 credits however it does um like if you do if you want to do a master that was enough for me to just do like uh like it fit throughout it didn't when i added everything up it was 45 so um yeah that is it oh, that means, is enough yeah so the electives that you took were then uh electives from the humanities department right to yeah focus. yeah yeah okay yeah. okay um okay someone's asking where the lecture is cool <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I personally am a big fan of Paula Sebulak, who uh, she taught the first block of uh, institutional substantive law, and then she was my research seminar um, teacher, so the human rights um, research seminar. Uh, yeah, she definitely makes it all very interesting, and um, she obviously she has a lot of experience, so I think for her it's just like the hundredth time telling students about European law, but she still makes it fun. I personally really liked her. I think she's doing also uh, a course in first year, actually. I don't know if she's like she taught, she did a legal integration in first year. So I don't know, maybe you've already had her. Uh, maybe you don't agree with me at all, but uh, yeah, I thought she was really nice. Okay, then I'd say we take a five minute break until 5.30. And then we'll continue with uh, the interview. Okay, see you in five minutes.
All right, everyone. Um, let's continue. So now what we're going to do is that um, we have Mrs. Fosliute here from the Center of European Policy Studies based in Brussels. Um, and Miriam is going to do a little interview with her. Um, in case you have any questions, you can always put them in the chat um, and eventually Miriam will be asking them. So yeah, take it away, Miriam. Thanks, Laura. Um, hi, Lena. Hello, everyone again. Uh, so I'm going to start by thanking you to be here, obviously, and um, by some intro introductory questions. If you could maybe introduce yourself uh, with a few words. Yes, I don't know. I will try to put more light now. I see for some reason there is a lot of light around me, but not in front of the camera, so I will get out of the shade. Uh, so hello everyone. My name is Lina Vosilute and I work as a research fellow at SEPS, uh, which is Brussels-based think tank, and we are in between academia, policy making, uh, civil society, I mean, yeah, and our daily business is research, uh, policy-oriented, let's say, research, and we usually advise, uh, for instance, European Commission, Parliament, uh, to, to come up with evidence-based recommendations, and my specific area, uh, justice and home affairs, so meaning uh, that we focus, as we like to laugh, in all areas where crises have recently happened. So uh, terrorism, rule of law, migration and asylum. Uh, so you can imagine how fun has been uh, the last five years um, for us. Yeah, I think we'll, uh, I, I will leave it here and we can speak with you. And maybe for the beginning, I would like also to know from people here, what kind of lawyers are you? Or if everyone are lawyers here, and if you could type, if you are like human rights, business, I don't know, in which fields you are focusing on. Um, yeah, I think uh, everyone here, or like mostly, would be first year students. So I don't, they don't have a background in law, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, anyone who's here. But yeah, I think this oh. is a, this is a, Introduction to law. Oh wow! Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, in from which fields you are coming then? What kind of studies you are doing? Um, so, European studies, pretty interdisciplinary. So, um, okay. Yeah. So, in our first year, we had a lot of different courses. So, we had um, history, culture, uh, some introduction to European law, um, and in the second year, we have to choose a major which is why we're you're coming in to talk to us a little bit about um european law and uh what the possible career options are uh well as a it's a good segue because i'm i want to ask you a little bit about your own studies so um yeah what's your academic background if i can ask yeah uh so my bachelors have initially been in politics political sciences and I think it was also kind of very generic, you know, uh, providing broad overview. It, it was in Lithuania, we taught us Magnus University, so we had a bit this, uh, I mean, it's a Lithuanian university, but it had this a bit American liberal tradition where you have more questions, answers, you know, debate and dialogue. Uh, uh, and some other universities like in, in Lithuania have this more like, uh, uh, yeah, memorizing let's say approach or, or this more traditional approach so i really like that part that we, uh, we had this very interactive uh, approach to our studies okay yeah and if i if i'm correct you did a human rights master after that yeah yeah then i went for uh human rights in central european university so again famous <laughs> that became famous because of hungarian uh, politics and actually rule of law crisis and it became a target of uh, orban's uh, political let's say ideology and so on and this university if you have just heard has been trying to move its chapters and to relocate into austria in vienna 
because actually government uh, have made it so difficult for this university to legally function in Hungary and you know yeah basically they want to take some accreditations away so but it's if anyone is interested I highly recommend uh, Central European University it's again uh, it's a private university founded by uh, American philanthropist uh, George Soros uh, that uh, is also is following this American liberal model of uh, teaching and uh, what's amazing about university and okay I guess you're experiencing uh, also in Netherlands that that it's people from all around the world and they really try to combine people and people with active or activist background are especially welcomed so let's say why i got uh, se selected because it was highly competitive you know to 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 get a place uh in this human rights course uh was because of my background in uh, civic and political activism in lithuania and elsewhere okay okay um yeah i want to ask you a little bit about uh the masters itself so first of all what made you kind of choose the master in human rights after your bachelor's in political science and uh how much law kind of you did in the master because i think it wasn't a master of law i think it was a master of it, it's master of arts and that's okay actually this was one of the programs where i mean it's it there are very few programs where no lawyer can go in kind of this human rights uh, field or then it's, it's something else like development studies or so on uh, but basically yeah my, my uh, one of the criteria was that i could get actually enrolled and secondly because i was already active in the field of human rights I, uh, I mean, I started my civic activism in some youth organizations and uh, I, I know that, okay, we are here today because Laura is active and uh, uh, how to say, convoking you all here and uh, I, I guess uh, some of you also are in part of some NGOs, yeah, or, or in some civic movements. Uh, so basically, I was involved in this, um, yeah, in different organizations, but especially with Council of Europe campaign, all different, all equal. Uh, we have been having um, kind of a serious issue uh, because in Lithuania, imagine, wow, now like 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah uh, no, okay uh it it was very uh homophobic country now it's changing uh, more and more and people are getting more open to speak about that uh but we actually had um tolerance trucks activity that was official activity by or, or campaign uh, initiated by european commission uh against transphobia for all rights and so on and the mayor of Konas of the city where I was working at that time decided to ban it as uh, gay and LGBT propaganda and you know uh, how to say so all kind of um, yeah they put it out in media basically to win some political votes and so on so actually I got involved into drafting a legal letter why why this uh, amounts to disinformation campaign on behalf of this mayor and of these news outlets that have been portraying this campaign as you know uh, propaganda and so on and um yeah actually human people working in human rights monitoring the institute saw my uh, legal briefing and argumentation and so on and then they were like, ah, are you a lawyer? And I was like, no, I'm not. But you know, it felt cool. It felt cool to use law to defend something that you feel strongly about and believe. And uh, okay, uh, yeah, it, it went further on uh, this legal thing, but then I kind of realized or that was turning point for myself where I, I, I thought, uh, yeah, about, human rights law in particularly that this is something super interesting for me and i would like to be 
involved in this field? Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much for this answer. Um, I obviously agree with you. I think human rights are really interesting. Um, but yeah, I'm a bit biased as well. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit about um, how did you make the jump from student life to your professional life? Mm, from student life to professional life, whew, I mean, I have been always, I mean, involved in different civil society organizations so that has been kind of parallel you know and i have been building my competences all along so in between universities while i was in in, in my bachelor's and, and master's i was uh still involved in different things and i worked for afterwards for some uh civil society organizations professionally i worked with uh, for instance european migrant domestic workers uh, uh organization respect uh, in in uh, preparation of ILO uh, decent work uh, convention where they didn't want it to see migrant uh, domestic workers or it was complicated for them to, to insert migrant domestic workers so we wrote or, or went up in international fora arguing why it's important and why it's it will be issue of of the future you know and why it's important to regulate uh, uh, this issue and so on and uh, th then this kind of um, yeah i would say the transition has been happening but for me the biggest switch was from ngo world or, or civil society world into academy uh, like this more academic research uh, world uh, where I, s I switched um, or actually uh, it was while i was uh, doing my blue book traineeship in Brussels at Economic and Social Committee. And we would be inviting various experts from think tanks, academia to come uh, uh, to present their findings on various topics. Again, I found it this very powerful and fascinating that you know we have experts presenting their analysis and then you know providing some policy options and that they are seriously or it seems so back in the day that they are seriously taken on board or into consideration uh now being research fellow myself i realized you know that uh, it's really very political when and how your uh, recommendations get uh, really taken into consideration but uh yeah this was a bit turning point and for me how to say one one way or one um, how i could do it because uh, i don't know if anyone you think about brussels so working in brussels or doing traineeships in brussels but after just finishing traineeship uh, a lot of people want to stay and they often risk to get in the loop of traineeships you know they finish one traineeship then they go to some ngo they start something and and you know you, you get stuck a bit uh, and then uh, we also sometimes accept you know we are accepting our we open calls for internships but th then uh, it's quite often that you see person with five traineeships or four traineeships and then you are like you know um some of them is good and nice but after a certain point it, it it can become a weakness also so uh, just to be cautious so wh what i did and i think this is interesting strategy for you to consider uh, that i actually went back to lithuania and in lithuania i went into a kind of think tank private research institute uh, where i started to work as researcher and there i built my capacity as a researcher i mean in lithuania uh, i was interesting because i had experience of of brussels let's say bubble and the institutional environment uh so but I, let's say but there they were keen of growing my uh uh, research and analytical competences and methodological competences and so on uh yeah so so uh yeah if if you want an anecdote almost uh that just immediately after traineeship i had a interview with my current boss uh and you know he was like 
very happy to see my master thesis that was again about migrant domestic workers he was like okay it's almost of phd level and so on so very nice uh, and but then he asked like okay have you done interviews have you done focus groups have you done surveys and then my answer was like you know two interviews and no focus groups and then you know uh, also not really uh, a lot of experience with the surveys and of course it was the big drawback because think tank wanted someone who can go immediately into the field and conduct interviews and you know for various ongoing studies and so i got back to lithuania and i did like i don't know hundreds of interviews uh, uh, focus groups delphi methods like uh, you know surveys and so on and uh, once i saw um, their call again uh, you know, I just was like, hi, here I am, but now I have all those skills and they were like, just, just come, you know, like, uh, when do you want to start? So how it's important to also know what's needed. Uh, another issue also, I think that also helped for me, let's say, uh, while being involved in civil society that in this academic or, or think tank world we also have to write our own tenders uh, like so you have to build project in order to be able to uh, conduct the study either for parliament commission or some foundation so on uh, so so this was one particular skill that we got from that i got from civil society and it was very interesting for let's say my employer to see that i can actually bring uh, funding with me so Okay, yeah. Well, thank you very much uh, for that answer, too. I want to ask you a little bit about, you talked a little about your research work. Um, what does that mean, like, on a daily basis? What do you, what does your researcher do? And uh, I also wanted to ask you, like, what is your favorite thing about that and maybe something you like less about it? What research should do? Uh, normally, we should do uh, like, uh, you know, all those uh, desk research analyses or uh, reading relevant case law, uh, yeah, co conducting uh, interviews, focus groups, surveys, uh, so on. However, uh, now, for instance, at this moment, I think I have six projects going on parallelly, and it's a lot of management. I mean, now I'm research fellow, so it's also like, okay, we have uh, people, um, uh, how to say, yeah, wor working with me or assisting and so on. Uh, and a lot of external colleagues that we need to manage and actually uh, one of the biggest skills is like this creative problem solving and uh, you know but because you i think one of the skills that really needed in this job is creativity uh, for instance today's situation uh, yeah some partners were supposed to lead the study and uh, now after like half time passed for the study they realized they cannot do it and we are legally responsible to implement it so you know question how you implement it who are the experts you want to have on the study and how to finalize it and and so on um yeah but it's um what you said what i like about this uh, job um, i mean so networking i think it's uh how to say at SEPS one of the greatest things is that you know if I used to um, when I used to write some academic uh, even my master thesis or bachelor's thesis and I was quoting some authors so now I really get to meet them to speak with them and you know to interact with them so in the beginning I was like kind of starstruck you know because all those people that you use in references they become all of a sudden real and very accessible and uh, you know and you can actually in interact with them that's amazing uh, then another thing also to interact with the policy world and to realize how european union you know all the machinery is working behind and uh, yeah i mean my personal motivation is to to make 
the change or, or to improve those EU policies where we are working on in, in, in terms of uh, fundamental rights compliance, rule of law, democratic accountability, and we keep, yeah, we keep pushing for that, but it's, uh, sometimes it's also demotivating because uh, political realities usually define whether or not, um, you know, certain findings or certain recommendations will be taken on board. Yeah, no, I, yeah, <laughs> I understand this answer because it does feel a little bit like this, uh, even sometimes just like reading about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to ask you a little bit um, specifically about uh, like the law part of the of your work. Um, so what do you think are skills that are required to um, to to work in the European law field? Like mm -hmm. per, like as a as a researcher or just a, as a law student as a professional? Yeah. And I think I here will, I will bridge with your question that I didn't touch upon uh, that, okay, f when I went from bachelor's to master's, you know, uh, my course was kind of, even it was MA, it was purely legal. We, we did legal briefing, so on. So I, I kind of had to change mentality, you know, like because in, in political science, the answer is it depends, you know, if you argue well, it depends. In law, no, you know, like there are criteria, there is case law, okay, it can depend what case law you uh, base yourself on or which articles you want to quote and, you know, there are also tensions between different rights, right to privacy, free, freedom of speech or so on, and, you know, you, you can still have arguments in between of those. Uh, uh, however, it really, uh, for me in the beginning it was very difficult to kind of shift and if you go to european union law it's even more defined you know if human rights law it's kind of still uh, broader uh, yeah european union law can be very specific and i remember as a student i would be just afraid of this european union law uh how to say courses because they seemed so technical and uh, uh, I mean, even uh, court like Strasbourg uh, court judgments or court of uh, uh, European Court of Human Rights judgments, uh, they are kindly nice, nice, you can read them nicely, how to say, they are a bit human language. And then if you read uh, the CGU or Court of Justice uh, in Luxembourg, you know, even the legal briefing would come kind of with this very technical language and so on. Uh, so in the beginning, this was a bit um, hard to grasp, but how to say, uh, nowadays we really, yeah, we, we analyze legal texts, political texts. Uh, for instance, one of our key issues is to, uh, to see how proposed policy uh, solutions, for instance, the if you if some of you are following the issues in migration uh, european commission proposed new eu uh, migration and asylum pact which is in many ways going uh, out of you know i mean infringing fundamental rights of eu uh, it lacks legal coherence with other eu legal texts uh, such as already pre-existing uh, reception condition directives or or asylum procedures directives I mean this one is being revised now so so we are kind of looking into how to say uh, we are looking into these legal texts and trying to analyze on the basis of law also on the basis of actual impact they are going to have to individuals let's say if, uh, what kind of impacts there would be uh, for for refugees and migrants, for for societies where they are, let's say, uh, at EU frontiers, so in Lesbos or in Greece, and you know what kind of impacts them in in Germany and so on. So so it's very um, yeah. We do EU law, but we do it now in the context, and I think that's much nicer rather than when you read just uh, those legal briefings. It seems very dry and, um, yeah, sometimes even boring, but uh, 
in our work it comes always in certain context and then yeah if you have some uh, important judgment you also then relate okay uh, yeah will it change the, the practices or, or on the ground or not why and so on okay hey, well thank you very much um for your answers i think i'm done with my question i don't know if um we have any questions in the chat or if anyone wants to send in anything um yeah okay uh, Laura's asking, how is it for you to move to Brussels and to know that you will probably stay there for a long time? I, I really wanted to go back to Brussels. Um, I, I mean, I lived uh, in different places, a bit in Malta, a bit in South Africa, a bit for my studies in Hungary. And, you know, I actually like to be outside of Lithuania more, I think, than I <laughs> like to be inside. But, um, uh, yeah, so, so during traineeship, I kind of felt like, okay, I really wanted to come back to Brussels. And that was, you know, I had this to take the step that I went back to Lithuania, got this experience, and then um, came, came back to Brussels as a professional already. So, uh, yeah, and I'm enjoying so far so good. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question myself, actually, another one I just thought of. Um, you, do you know, like, of any other jobs that you could do, again, like, being in the law field, but not being uh, a lawyer, not having a law degree, but that is still, like, law-oriented? Uh, what kind of uh, more legal job I could do? I mean, I, I, if People, I think, could go more either to, towards civil society or, uh, let's say, to do also some kind of analysis or briefings. Uh, even, uh, I mean, I could do even paralegal work, let's say, for asylum applicants or, or so on, you know, like if, if you want to be very practical. Uh, I think that's not a problem. But then, um, also for big international or, or organizations such as UNHCR or, or IOM, you know, you could do also some kind of a bit more legal angle, I think. And then, um, yeah, it's institutions or governments, I've, you know, that's another area where you can find yourself. But, um, yeah, that's, I, I guess, or, or or some legal firms but uh, although i guess legal firms then really like you to be a uh, lawyer in the bar you know who has passed the bar exam and so on so uh yeah um yeah we have a couple more questions madeline is asking um in your job sorry it's lighting up uh, <laughs> in your job what do you spend most of your time on uh, whew, good question. Now I need to think. Um, I, I think management and communication, especially now, especially when we have like kind of six projects uh, going around, uh, that's that's more uh, prevalent. Um, before, when I started, let's say when I uh, as a researcher, I would spend more time on actual writing and you know analyses or interviews or so on but i you know uh after a while I, I think i got also more and more responsibilities which is good you know <laughs> it, so yeah so i would say on management of uh, other people projects uh partners consortiums so on so it's more Okay, thank you. Uh, David is asking, is the environment at the SEPS International or rather Europe focused? Mm, good question, David. I think it's, um, I think it's, you mean among colleagues, like who are the colleagues? Okay. Um, yeah, it's mainly EU, uh, citizens but we have also more and more or at SEPS we are even having uh, 
proactive diversity policy, which is called, uh, we call it SEPS DGs, SEPS Diversity Goals. Um, and we have increasingly also people from other backgrounds coming or some, for instance, yeah, we used to have one Afghani colleague, now we have an Afghani intern, Iranian intern, and among colleagues we have Moroccan or Turkish, uh, yeah. But this, this is still kind of, uh, still EU, I would say, and especially Italians are prevalent. <laughs> yes, <laughs> everywhere in the EU, <laughs> yeah. Um, the fun question is from Charles. He's asking, um, do you have any advice between doing a semester at CEU and an internship in Brussels? Mm, like if I would have to choose between the two or? I guess so, yeah. Mm. I mean, it, it depends what you want to do, but um, I mean, CEU is excellent for also networking and I mean we have very very strong alumni community you know like even here in Brussels for instance we have alumni chapters and we have been actually actively going and protesting against you know this eviction of CU from Hungary so uh, and even before that there would be like more social networking uh, around the CU so I would say you know, it, it's not either or, but even CU alumni is a kind of uh, nice network to rely on. Um, then for for set, for this uh, internships in Brussels, um, I would say to be also a bit uh, strategic and selective. I mean, um, because sometimes you feel that people are you know, trying to come to Brussels without knowing why. And I think once you know why, and uh, if you, let's say, I don't know, focus on asylum issues, uh, then you have c certain places to go. You can go to Digicom, to IASO, okay, this is actually based in Malta, or uh, to some EU agencies also that people sometimes forget about. It's not only uh, commission, and it gives you also um, good overview what's happening in the field. And then I think it's, you can also think where to focus. But sometimes we really have people, for instance, applying for our unit when they did on the master thesis, something about trade or investment. And then you're like, hey guys, you know, it's, uh, okay, maybe it would be interesting to broaden your horizons, but it's so off topic. And then it's just, um, yeah. So I think it, re it really shows and you can see when people are applying for internships, if they have been seeing some kind of track and... Uh, um, the following question is from Caroline, I think. Would you advise students to study abroad? Definitely. <laughs> I mean, er Erasmus, uh, you know, depends. <laughs> Uh, I have to say, <laughs> because it, it has been uh, famous for uh, what Erasmus children and Erasmus families and you know all this kind of uh, other uh, let's say social added value that comes with that. But um, but for uh, for very good reasons, I think also choosing your university if it has the key academics. Uh, I mean, once you know in your field who are the key academics, it's interesting to chase a bit them, you know, because, uh, okay, so some people will be, of course, arrogant and not having time and because they are so on top of the things, but otherwise it can open also very nice horizons for you if you are with these key leading, you know, academics in the field because they might have uh, very interesting projects where they need uh, to have project assistance and so on. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Cyprian, if I'm pronouncing this correctly, is asking how useful do you think was the traineeship for your career? Uh, I think it was 
how to say, yeah, defining moment to go for re research type of uh, job. Uh, because before, as I said, I was more in, in civil society, uh, advocacy uh, world. So, so it, it, it served a bit as an eye opener, what else I could do there. And, uh, you know, I, I saw myself in, in, in this role, so definitely. Uh, then one thing I did uh, while my traineeship, and especially for those who think about Brussels, uh, here is okay now with COVID times it's different and you can do it remotely but uh, n normal times uh, you would have plenty of conferences going every day on all different topics you know there are different think tanks EU institutions so on or uh, civil society organizations putting up uh, conferences on Roma, on asylum, on, I don't know, trade and investment, if you are interested in that thing. Uh, so, and you can go there, you know, see the experts and uh, during lunch breaks, ni nice thing would be to try to interact, to, to see the people and so on. So I did my fair share of uh, networking in the area of migration uh, and actually even uh, said for some organizations that I knew they are doing a great job, that I'm here in Brussels, if we can meet for coffee and so on. And I met with them and, you know, we, yeah, I mean, for me, it helped that I was still also parallelly in civil society, so I could say, like, okay, we can collaborate or so on, so. Um, uh, David has a follow-up question. So does the institute the Institute focus on the internal policies of the EU, or does it also explore the relation that the EU has with other countries and organizations? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, just to better define, we are like independent think tank. Uh, and there are, for instance, European uh, Union or Commission has its own think tank. Uh, actually, uh, Parliament has its own research service, then the Commission has its own uh, research center and knowledge center, and uh, Council has its own like thing and so on. So, but we are like a bit outsiders, and this allows us to be independent and critical, and I like that part. Um, and we focus actually. I mean, even in my unit, uh, you cannot speak about migration without speaking about, you know, bilateral de deals, EU-Turkey statement, uh, how migrate, you know, relations with Libya and how, um, uh, yeah, or EU uh, trust fund for Africa and the way uh, it's being implemented uh, in order to prevent migration and so on. So, I mean, my topic is by all means um, intertwined internationally and currently even we have also projects that uh, will look uh, more and more globally but also the same is true for other colleagues in other units for instance we look how global compact on migration and asylum and uh, um, uh, sorry uh, global compact on refugees is being implemented in EU but also let's say in Canada, South Africa, Bangladesh, Jordan, and so on. So uh, it depends sometimes on the projects, but at this moment we have very global projects. Also colleagues working on artificial intelligence have very global projects at the moment. Or, uh, and we have even one unit which is called EU in the world, uh, which is precisely about EU's external action and uh, external policies, if that's your interest. Okay, thank you. I think uh, I think we're out of questions. So I think uh, I'll yeah. give the floor to Laura and thank you very much uh, for your answers. Yeah, okay. I think we come uh, to an end. I would like to thank everyone uh, who um, has taken the time to be here. And of course, uh, also to Mrs. Vosliute, Thank you very much for your answers. I think it was very, very insightful for all of us. Um, and yeah, on behalf of O20, I would like to, uh, everyone who kind of worked on this project and helped us. Um, and yeah, have a nice evening. <laughs>
uh, dear Laura, could I uh, add just my last two cents? Of course. Because when you do uh, just one very creative thing that I think it's uh, for you worth to consider, once you do your uh, master thesis or bachelor thesis, and you think about your methods, I think very nice idea is to try to interview people. You know, some will say no to you, but others will open the doors. And actually this will be for you the way to step in a bit and to see what it is like, you know, just by speaking with these people. So, uh, yeah, so really try to consider and this person to person contact, even on Zoom, uh, you know, like, or, or via phone, it's still quite valuable. And uh, who knows, if you took uh, some very topical, um, uh, how to say, if your thesis on, on, is on something very topical and, you know, where policy interest lies or so on, uh, people may wish, you know, to, to consider you or to invite you for some projects or so on. So, so just uh, consider that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I think that will be very useful for all of us. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, Lena. <laughs>